All right. Hello and welcome. It looks like we've got a few attendees. Um, we'll just wait a minute or so just to ensure we can get as many as possible. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll just get started shortly. All right, let's hit it, guys. So welcome to the first M MLA projections webinar um, for sheep. Today we'll, we will be discussing the recent sheep projections, which will be released after today's webinar. Thanks all for taking the time to attend. My name is Stuart Bull and I will be your moderator today. I am the senior market analyst um, at MLA and I'm originally from Narandra in the in the Riverina um, of a sheep cropping and cattle farm. And with me today, I'm pleased to present Steve Bignall, who's a market information manager, and Ripley Atkinson, who was our market information analyst, here today as our expert panel. I'm just going to um, hand over to Steve for a quick background. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Stu. Um, a bit about myself. I'm, as Stu said, market information manager at MLA, looking after all the supply insights from an MLA perspective for sheep, cattle, and goats. Uh, a bit about myself. I am from, I've been at MLA for a year now in this role, and before that, uh, I'm from a farm in Cochinup that does merinos, dorpers, thoroughbreds, and cropping. Thanks, Stu. Thanks for that, Steve. I'll just hand it over to Ripley Atkinson. Morning, Stu, and um, looking forward to today. My name is Ripley Atkinson. I'm the market information analyst with the MLA. I am originally from Tamworth, northern New South Wales, from a mixed cropping operation at Winton. Sheep, cattle, merinos and beef. We uh, then moved to Nundal and ran a beef operation up there. Thanks so much for that, Rip. Um, so we have provided our contact details on the screen, as you can see. Apologies if there's any lag with the slides, we'll do our best. Um, but again, this will be re recorded. Should you have any market information questions for us around the projections or um, supply pieces, please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll do our best to get back to you on those. Before we start, there are just a few housekeeping points that I'd like to raise. First of all, um, all of the participants, so the audience will be on mute during the presentation. There will be 20 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we will not be answering questions during the delivery section of the webinar. Please enter any of your questions that you have in the Q&A function located at the top right of your screen. And we will endeavor to get to all of those questions, um, but understand that if we can't get to all of them, we will get back to you on notice. Again, this webinar is being recorded and it will be um, placed on the MLA website in the trends and analysis page. Um, again, near where you can access the updated projections document. Um, and of course, at the end of today, there will be the weekly, which is our weekly newsletter will go out with an update of the projections as well um, and also via the media release. We'd also love if you guys could just take um, a couple of minutes at the end of the webinar to fill out a few questions for a survey. We really value your feedback and look to do, um, I guess, yeah, we just want to make this as best as possible for you guys for the future as well. Before we start the presentation, I just want to hand over to, um, to the team just to quickly touch on the state of the industry report, which was recently released. I'll just hand over to the panel. Thanks for that. <coughs> Thanks for that, Stewie. Um, so before we get into the sheep projections webinar, we'll just touch on the state of the industry report, which was released this Tuesday, uh, co-released between MLA and with Minister Littleproud. Um, what the state of the industry report is, is it is the market information team's preeminent uh, document released annually. And the document looks at the contribution of the red meat industry to Australia's economic uh, <coughs> economic. Uh, contribution to the Australian economy from on-farm production right through to processing and retail. It's used by government institutional organisations uh, when making 
when making large investment decisions, but it's also a great reference document just for uh, the industry itself, whether advocating or uh, just for, for note. It measures industry's economic output from a range of measures, including turnover, uh, revenue, industry value add, which is the contribution to uh, GDP, employment, the number of businesses in the industry and exports. It also includes five snapshots that cover timely matters that are relevant to the red meat industry and sector. It, it was released, like I said, the WHO by Minister Little Proud and Jason Strong on Tuesday. And the key takeaways from the 2021 publication were that Australia's, uh, while only accounting for 5% of the global sheep flock and 1% of the global cattle uh, herd, we are the second largest uh, exporter of beef and the largest exporter of sheep meat. Also, encouragingly, was that the Australian red meat industry had a revenue of $69.9 billion in 2020 financial year, up 5% on the 2019 figure. So we're well on our way to $100 billion. Um, the other points were that Australian exports were, uh, so Australian exports were 18 billion and the industry value was 17.1 and that we employ 445 thousand people with 195.8 of the thousand of these being directly employed in the industry. So all in all, it was a really, really positive story told in the uh, MLAE uh, State of the Industry Report. And for further information on it, people can either use the QR code on the slide now, or as Stu said, it'll be in the weekly or on our trends and analysis page, which is where the projections will also be available. Um, we're also happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Steve. Certainly recommend. It's a very comprehensive document that just highlights how important um, the industry is to the national economy and such. So definitely have a look. Let's get into the heart and fast of it now, guys. So let's start with the sheet projections and I'm going to fire away a few key questions um, to our panel today. So first of all, I just want to ask the panel what are some of the key takeaways to, to take away from the October release? So there are sort of three key takeaways, uh, Stu, from the October release. It's that we've got the flock growing. Uh, it will reach 70.6 uh, million head this year. So that's sort of higher than we'd initially expected. Uh, and what we also do expect is to hit 76 uh, million head by 2023. So we're expected to enter a period of prolonged growth, a jump this year and a more steady growth through to 2023, that we expect lamb slaughter to uh, hit 20.55 million. So up for, uh, three to 4% on last year. Um, so to, to rebuild during a rebuild phase, that's really encouraging to have lamb slaughter go up. And also that we expect a far larger lamb cohort for this year in 2021. Fantastic. So I guess three keys. We're looking at higher flock, sorry, higher flock growth, um, strong slaughter levels, and also we're seeing a strong um, spring lamb crop coming through. The next one I wanted to ask is so just looking at some of the revised figures this round. I noticed that the flock has lifted by about 2.5 million head from the previous release, which equates to a 6.6 .6 million or a 10% rise year on year. Um, to 70.6 million head. What are the key reasons for this revision and does this signify a continuation of the rebuild? So similar to past rebuilds in 2011 and 2016, as, as you can see on this graph, we are going to go through a period of quite a jump in, in the rebuild. In 2016, the flock jumped 5 million head uh, when it went up by 7% uh, in one year. This year, we have got it up around 6.6 uh, 6, uh, million head, finishing at 70.6 uh, million head. But the things to take away is that we're in the second year of a rebuild. We had a good year last year in 2020, finished the year strong with the seasonal conditions. We've got continued rain uh, throughout this year and the bomb outlook is really, uh, really positive through to the end of the year. Um, so pasture isn't expected to dry off, there'll be groundwater, um, so that'll flow through into 2022. Uh, we also, since our June release, Drew, so where you mentioned that we've sort of rev um, revised it up 2.5 million since June, is in that time we got our, our MLA, uh, MLA and AWI sheep meat and wool, uh, wool survey, and we've got the results from them from our June wave. And in that, marking rates have 
improved significantly. We've got marking rates in the 90% across all breeds um, and the retention of younger ewes is, has been something that we've definitely seen. Um, and it's uh, there's been a clear intent from producers that they want to rebuild through building up through their flocks. So that that's all led to this increase in the flock for what we're predicting in 2021 through to 2023. And I would just touch lastly on is that we're seeing more um, first cross use being held for uh, breeding purposes. So that's what we're seeing. Uh, some that would have normally flowed through to slaughter. We are seeing um, crossbred ewes being retained for breeding purposes more than ever before. Fascinating. Okay. Thanks for that. That was very comprehensive and just a, a strong sign of, of, I guess, what we've seen for the last couple of years and, and hopefully what we can um, continue to see. On the back of, again, we just talked about the flock and you touched on the climate. I'm just keen to know around, you know, where we come from, where are we now and where are we looking for in terms of the impact of the climate um, for producers and also um, again, talking about the flock and for the uh, production. Yes, yeah, Stu, thanks for that. It's um, it's an interesting one. You know, we we all certainly know that that the seasonal conditions we've experienced over over the last eighteen months for most sheep producing regions have been fantastic, and the bomb expects that c to continue for for a lot of those regions uh, till the end of the calendar year. You know, spring into early summer. And, and when you look at the positives from this, from the pasture growth and the pasture bodies of pasture that we already have, and, and the expectation that this rain and some milder temperatures, which will promote pasture growth without it drying off too quick to continue, the expectation that this will will really support carcass weights moving forward for production is is really exciting. And, and what that means is through, through price incentivization for producers at the minute with more grass, you know, that there's a good margin there for producers to turn off off lambs at, at heavier carcass weights. And, and as a result of this, this increase in carcass weights on the back of the seasonal conditions and the expectation for the next three months for that to continue, this is why we're expecting to see carcass weights, um, carcass weight production, you know, increase by 23,000 tonnes from 2020 to hit five point, uh, 510,000 uh, carcass weight tonnes, which is really positive, you know. Um, it's 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 been fantastic and and another point to make is obviously well potentially you would hope so that the you know this harvest is another good one there's plenty of grain around for those lot finished lambs which we'll touch on later and and obviously also those milder temperatures or the forecast milder temperatures are going to promote some pretty positive pasture growth um you know you look across to wa and it's had a really good season and 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 they're a little bit behind the eastern states with their rebuild at the minute but obviously through the season the autumn and winter that they've had that's really going to kick their rebuild into gear which is really exciting for the western australian flock you know you look at the negatives of of what the past couple of months has brought for some people and we particularly can isolate that to so you know let's give an example of the mallee in in south australia it's had a dry winter and pasture availability quality is is low, and and as a result, in the past few weeks, particularly last week in South Australia, we saw 19,000 lambs yarded, and because pasture availability and the dry conditions have forced producers to turn off, on top of the fact that the market is is incentivising or increasing that propensity to do so because there's a good strong margin there, um, you know, with these large yardings we've seen recently out of South Australia, we're expecting the spring flush or there's potential for the spring flush in South Australia to be a little softer, um, you know, because of those large yardings that have come onto the market earlier than traditionally expected. And that's flowing on to New South Wales and Victoria, which, which Stu's brought up here at the minute. The New South Wales and Victoria new season lamb yardings compared to the five-year average have been a little bit delayed. You know, that, that point number one, we expect to see, you know, historically that the the peak of the new season lambs will be hit in sort of the first week of December but at the minute there's there's certainly the situation where where the finish quality of lambs has has held held lambs back a little bit without hitting hitting supply and hitting its straps in line with that five year average which is really driving that situation and and sort of to bring it all back to one piece the climate outlook is very positive and on the back of that, the heavy lambs we expect to see continue to come in good numbers because of the seasonal conditions and that that three months outlook, which is promoting some pretty positive sentiment for producers. And, and you know, as, as a result, 
in 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 the end game that production volume of 510,000 tons carcass weight is is supported by these expectations. Great, thank you. Um, certainly, plenty of different dynamics to consider, particularly at this time of year. Which brings me on to the next question regarding lamb slaughter. So again, lamb slaughter is tipped to exceed 20.5 million head, um, reaching 20.55 million this year, which is a rise of 3% year on year. Um, how is that possible in a rebuild year? Uh, thanks for the question, Stu. And I'll just add one thing onto what Rip said is, is with the bomb outlook so positive and being the second year of um, a rebuild, and, and improve seasonal conditions, there's actually going to be water and grain so that the rebuild we know in 2022, if the season turns, we definitely won't have a disaster in 2022 because we have those grain stocks, we have that water. Um, so that's why we've gone for a longer term um, rebuild. Uh, in terms of regarding your question around lamb slaughter, it comes down to we're expecting a bigger uh, cohort. As we talked about before, we have uh, marking rates jumping 10% this year um, based on our MLA AWI uh, survey that we got back in June. So we've got it across mid 90s, across marking rates across the 90s, across all breeds. So with that big jump, we're expecting uh, the, there to be 35.5 million lambs this year. Uh, and that is 1 million above the five year average. So with that bigger cohort, what we expect is that we expect there's more lambs for producers to retain and more lambs for producers to sell. So that's why we're seeing the uh, slaughter this year to increase. We're already 4% above 2020 slaughter today. And last week, when we compare week uh, 40 2021 with week 40 2020, we were above it. Uh, last week we hit 369,000 lamb slaughter uh, coming on uh, outperforming 2020 slaughter. So it's, uh, it's a really positive sign for 2020 slaughter. Fantastic. So again, I've just noticed a bit of a contradiction between lamb and mutton. So if I look towards the mutton slaughter, it's actually forecast um, to fall to 5.1 million head, which is back 14% year on year. What are the key drivers of this change and the decline? It's an interesting one, Stu, you know, the, the mutton situation at the minute. Obviously, you know, it is, we are expecting it to hit 5.1 million, which is the lowest it'll it'll have been since 2011, which which to a point was another rebuild year um, when when the flock grew following um, drought and those those good seasons in 2010, 2011. Um, and as a result, that 14% decline, if you look at yardings nationally compared to the five year average, they're lower by 13%, which is sort of a, equating to around 338,000 head, which is fairly significant. And, and obviously yardings translate in, into our, our situation here at the minute. And as a result of that that lower, um, you know, slaughter volume we expect to see, production also is is expected to hit 130,000 tonnes carcass weight, which is which is quite significant. And you know, supported by the sheep meat survey, um, we've mentioned it, and and it's a pretty prominent you know prospect and and comment is is producers' intentions and and what they've been doing is retaining older ewes, um, you know, and retaining more replacement ewes than what they traditionally would. And, and as they're holding on to them, um, you know, it's sort of flowing in supported by the seasons for this seasonal confidence that, that it's bringing and, and the medium term market outlook um, underpinned by these export positives for mutton. And, you know, as a result that, that Steve mentioned, first cross user being retained a lot more. The first, for the first time ever, we've seen uh, Merino use as a total of the breeding ewe flock number sit below 75% and and that increase in first cross use retention has brought back that that number of merino use as a total um and another point to discuss obviously is the wool price has performed relatively well um in 2021 and and it's obviously incentivizing for incentivizing producers to you know retain merino use to, to capitalise on on that gross margin and and the opportunity of profit profitability that a fleece can bring Fantastic. Um, very comprehensive. Thank you. The, the next one, again, you've touched on how slaughter is is meant to be going up this year, and we've seen those signs. Um, will the improved season also help to drive heavier carcass weights and production volumes? 
Thanks for that, uh, Stu. So Rips already talked about a little, talked about it a little bit. So we've got carcass weights tipped to increase 100 grams uh, to 24.8 kilograms per head for lambs this year, and it's not as significant as the 4% or kilo um, rise that we saw from 2019 to 2020. That's because we're in the second year of this rebuild, and while um, there's been some favourable, uh, favourable conditions helping rearing and marking rates this year. Last year, those favourable conditions, even if the marking rates were smaller, did help the um, lambs put on weight. So this year, the, we're not expecting as great a rise in carcass weights for lambs, but they are still historically high and at record levels. And, and what's pushing that is the price incentive, which, which, which Rip touched on, which those high prices are incentivizing producers to add additional kilos. We're seeing that already. We're seeing far more heavy lambs come through. And what we're seeing this year, what we've seen is old season lambs held for longer and sort of um, pushed across the longer time frame. Uh, so we're seeing heavier lambs over a longer period of time, more heavy lambs. Uh, there's also an abundance of grass, which makes it cheap to put on additional kilos. We're seeing uh, producers graze crops. So we're seeing those those high carcass weights are going to push production, as Rip said, to 510,000 tonnes uh, this year, which is near a record, but not uh, surpassing uh, 2016 levels. But in 2022, we do have on the back of increased slaughter and high carcass weights, uh, production hitting 551,000 tonnes, slightly better in 2023 when it will go to 555,000 tonnes. And this is as the uh, rebuild matures and lamb sl slaughter increases, we're going to hit those record levels, which really puts the lamb uh, Australian lamb production at, a, at the forefront uh, to meet sort of increasing uh, global demands for sheep meat and for lamb that we're seeing. Uh, in 2022, the carcass weight difference between sheep and lamb will soften. We think that this could be the case as more uh, producers who have retained ewes that might have been cull this year, they come on, those cull ewes come onto the market next year, are uh, possibly a little bit lighter. So we're expecting to see a convergence of uh, lamb and sheep weights uh, next year. That's that's what we're expecting. If we look at the sheep gain on a carcass weight basis, we've got sheep carcass weights this year increase, increasing 40, uh, 400, 400 grams, sorry, to 25.6 kilograms per head. Um, this is attributed to, like we said, we're seeing more crossbred ewes come through the system. So they're just adding a little bit of weight, but also similar to what's happening in the sheep game, uh, lamb game, sorry, price incentives and easy access to, to uh, grass is pushing those up. The thing in the sheep game is the increase in uh, carcass weights for sheep, which will be around 2%, won't offset the fall in slaughter because that is, is just so drastic. And one thing that uh, we're seeing with that sheep slaughter is that we have seen if, if producers were ca carrying a bit of debt coming out of the drought, they're more likely, so in 2020, they were more likely to send our uh, ewes to slaughter than rebuild to get a bit of cash. But in the second year, we've seen this uh, a few times in, as a strategy, is in that second year, producers will retain uh, more ewes because they've made the cash in, in 2020 when they sold a few of the cull ewes. This year, they're, they're more likely to keep them and they might sell them again next year. Okay. Plenty to think about. Thank you for that, Steve. The next one I just touched on just from the document that I've seen there, you, I think you touched on the notion of kind of grain fed lamb and um, containment feeding. I think tr traditionally I've always associated lamb being grass fed, um, you know, they're beautiful, they're plump, um, great quality. And yet we are seeing some shifts to grain fed potentially. Are you guys able just to um, just let us know kind of what volumes are we seeing? Is there um, a shift to this kind of trend and what can we expect moving forward? It's probably a tale of two states. Rip will touch on the east states, eastern states, but from a WA and SA perspective, uh, the, in WA, the good season so um, has meant that there has been more grass and WA traditionally does um, grain, uh, trail, trail feed grain across those sort of summer uh, months into autumn and because Saroja was here and there's a, a, a huge uh, pasture profile there's a, and big uh, stubbles, there's, there's probably less coming off actual containment 
or, or trail feeding uh, this year. So we did see WA uh, grain fed numbers in that survey go down. In SA, in South Australia, we also saw, which traditionally do, do a bit more of that grain feeding as a percentage um, fall. But in South Australia, it's actually because, as Rip touched on before, they haven't had as good seasonal conditions as we've had in the rest of the country. And so just because their uh, flock is smaller, we've seen the grass fed, a uh, grain fed, sorry, portion in South Australia also uh, reduce. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one from your perspective, you know, Western Australia, South Australia, Steve, I'll, I'll touch on the Eastern states, um, Victoria particularly, we've seen a really positive sentiment come out of there with with grain finished or, or lambs purchased to go to be lot finished. Um, Ballarat and Bendigo, particularly when we look at our figures, we've seen some serious, you know, um, increases in feeder lambs being purchased uh, to be lot finished. And then obviously grain finished lambs coming onto those, those sale yard markets down there as well, which has been, you know, really exciting and not something that we've, we've seen a whole lot of before. It's always played a part, but it's certainly becoming more prominent. Um, you know, you look into, into New South Wales, the Riverina, you know, Griffith, Wagga, Forbes, Selex, Cowra through to Carcor, you know, continuing all year to have been delivering some really good quality and volumes of heavy finished, you know, grass fed, uh, grain fed lamb, sorry, which has been, which has been really good. And they're, they're, they've obviously always played a big part, but I think the point to take away from this one is certainly Victoria um, has increased their propensity to do that. And it, it seems to be becoming more prominent. Um, you know, when you look at production and, and the impact that that's having on, you know, aside from the seasonal conditions and those grain finished heavy lambs, uh, grass finished heavy lambs, the grain finished is contributing, you know, significantly too. And, and that's obviously underpinning our forecasts for 2022, 2023, and, and this year at 510,000 tonnes carcass weight, which has been really good to see. And and as that increases and, and lot finished lambs increase in Victoria as well, it's continue, it's going to continue to support and underpin underpin what, what we're suggesting in regarding to, you know, that carcass weight lifting by 100 grams and obviously the production as a more important factor. Um, the other one to look at is obviously the producer's risk management strategies. You know, they, after the drought or during the drought, if, if producers were containment feeding sheep or lambs, they've still got the infrastructure. And now with, with significant volumes of grain available on the domestic market, it's providing them an opportunity to re reuse or, or start using those those infrastructure pieces again because it's already there you know and and as a risk management strategy when you think about it producers can now have a bit more consistent cash flow they know they can turn off lambs at certain specs with with plenty of grain available and it just provides a little bit more consistency as a risk management strategy for for producers moving forwards thank you for that rip yeah we've seen again within the beef sector some of um, the positives to come out of the lot feds um, game. So certainly something to track moving forward. The next one, so let's change tack a bit. We've focused a lot on the domestic um, supply piece. I just want to ask the panel, what are we expecting to see with exports so far? Uh, sorry, what have we seen so far and what are we expecting to see for the remainder of the year and, and, and uh, looking forward? Yeah, Stu, the exports, particularly out of land this year, have been been really positive. Overall exports to year to August are up 6%, um, accounting for around 10,700 tonnes compared to 2020. China's relatively firm, um, but the US is, is, is the interesting one and the exciting one to talk about at the minute. It's up 26% year to August, um, accounting for around 10,100 tonnes. And, and it's really grown quite strongly. And as we see consumers start to get a taste for an Australian lamb piece as, as a protein, it is considered a premium niche product, but you know, with the market scale and scope over there, it's providing a pretty exciting opportunity, particularly this year, um, you know, for the nine months to, to where we are now and, and how it's delivered. Another one to talk about South Korea, um, you know, it's grown 14% year to August this year compared to last. and. Um, you know, over the last decade, South Korea alone, its exports have grown sixfold from Australia, which is which is really significant. Wow. And and another exciting piece on top of that is where, or, or South Korea's import lamb imports, Australia accounts for ninety three percent of that. 
which is which is a really positive piece to take away. And and what that's you know meaning is there's an opportunity for Australian you know lamb exporters and producers to capitalise on on what that means into that kind of market and the growth we've seen you know certainly in the last decade and obviously after you know over the last twelve months. Um, just a bit of an interesting one. If you look at how it's consumed in South Korea, um, it's considered a trendy protein. You know, you, you're cool if you eat it. Um, <laughs> traditionally, in food service, it's served in in a barbecue sort of style. And and from from a retail perspective, consumers purchase it and enjoy it in camping environments, out in the bush. Um, you know, in in a different sort of setting. If we look at chilled and uh, chilled and frozen exports. Chilled exports are down um, this year, back six percent, and and a lot of that's been driven by the COVID-induced freight, um, logistical, and shipping issues. But um, you know, on the other side, frozen exports year to August, you know, they're up thirteen percent, which has been pretty positive. Um, you know, exciting to see. And and if we move into mutton, mutton exports down six percent overall um, year to August. And and traditionally, we sort of see mutton exports account for around 30% of overall total, and um, that's certainly the case this year. 31% um, of total sheep meat exports in 2021. Um, China is the big one to discuss. Obviously, um, it's up 27% year to August, um, and it's obviously contradicting that downturn of 6% that we're seeing globally. China's just steaming ahead, um, you know, in in 2021 and. And it's really reinforcing, I think, for our listeners, China's position as as the number one mutton exporting destination for for Australia. You know, it's accounting for forty percent of our total mutton exports, and and it's a pretty important, um, obviously, nation as, as a part of that mutton situation. Chilled chilled exports, um, looking at those, they're back two percent, but when you look at it relatively, the chilled volume compared to frozen is is quite small. You know, it's, it's not very significant, but. The frozen exports back 6% is obviously more significant, um, you know, as it does dominate the overall export volumes. Um, again, COVID caused some real headaches for, for exporters there, um, you know, freight, shipping and logistical issues that have challenged that overall export market in 2021. Um, but to finish on a positive, positive note, Southeast Asia behind obviously China than the US is the third most important mutton market um, with you know, and and I spoke about South Korea, but there's obviously plenty of other countries included in that in that region. It's quite exciting, um, you know, that we know Asia, the Asian continent, is really important to our to our mutton exports. But for Southeast Asia to be in that position, um, looking forwards, those underpin uh, uh, fundamentals are underpinning some pretty positive outlooks for for Southeast Asia and potentially the the contribution our mutton can make to to those communities and cultures. Fantastic. Certainly plenty of good signs with the export trade and hopefully some better things to come um, as we can escape out of this COVID crisis. The next thing is the other market that we that you didn't touch on was actually Middle East and North Africa. I was just hoping to get an update um, on that and are we expecting improved signs from that market? Thanks for that, Stu. Um, one thing I will touch on just before going into that is where we sort of see exports, uh, where we projected them. So what we have said, Rick said that lamb exports were up uh, 6% for the year to date, and that's where we have them flowing through to when we get to the end of the year. So we have them up uh, 6% to uh, 280 uh 280,000 tonnes shipped weight, uh, and we do have mutton down quite significantly uh, to 130, uh, 130,000 tonnes, but that's just in line again with what we're seeing, what we expect production to do from the mutton side. Um, from the MENA perspective, it's a really interesting one. I think the MENA market has been super important to Australian lamb and to mutton over time. But those economies were really affected and are really affected by COVID. They're oil dependent, uh, tourism dependent and transit dependent. With the, the chilled, uh, chilled exports into the Middle East from Australia have been impacted with less cargo and less passenger planes into the area. As, uh, as 
transport and flights into that area pick up, we do expect uh, chilled lamb exports to, to increase into the area. We also know that MENA is hosting the World Cup. They've got Expo coming up and we expect to some of that sort of uh, tourism um, hard pilgrims, pilgrimages to, to recommence. So really uh, put some um, upward upward pressure on exports to, to mid, the Middle East, which would be really encouraging. But one big thing that we're seeing into the Middle East, and it's probably been affected, uh, all markets have been affected, but definitely the Middle East, is on that logistical issue with containers and getting access to uh, refrigerated uh, sea containers has been difficult. It's all, it's expensive and it's logistically difficult. And that's really put some pressure uh, into to MENA. Um, we also have the removal of um, of the subsidies into Qatar. But one encouraging thing is it's uh, not so much the export of lamb or mutton into the Middle East, but it is the um, re-entry of Saudi Arabia uh, into the live export market. So that's been really encouraging. One thing, uh, Stu, before I do throw it back to you is uh, Papua New Guinea has become the, third, uh, the fifth biggest uh, lamb export market. So it's jumped a bit this year and it's um, a really encouraging trend. Fantastic, thank you for that. It seems like there's obviously a myriad of factors that can influence price. You've touched on um, some of those domestic drivers, but then of course, given that we are an exporting nation for our red meat, where we e export more than what we consume, um, certainly those, um, some of those, those dynamics within the key export markets obviously play a part. So this brings me on to my next question. My final question to the panel is again, how are we looking at price, particularly for trade lamb to date, and where are things looking to go? Yeah, so thanks, Stu. Oh, Stu, I was just going to start. I'll start with the price forecast we have, and then Rip, I might throw over to you for some of the quest, some of the reasons around, or, or some of the prices we've seen. But for the first time ever, we ran a uh, NTLI uh, price forecast involving six industry analysts and averaged their upper limit, medium and lower limit. Um, we ran it in the air, he got a lot of good positive feedback uh, from producers, it was something they're looking for. Um, as you can see here, the upper limit of the six uh, analysts is, is that uh, Trade Lamb obviously will taper into the end of the year, but <clears throat> finish above where it was last year, the upper limit is 8.91, medium uh, limit or, or the average could say is uh, 836 and a lower limit at 760. But but Rip, you might want to expand more on sort of the year that's been and some of the, the factors impacting price. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I think um, when you look at, when I rattle off a few of these, it, it certainly has been on a national level, a year of records. Um, you know, producer sentiment and, and a lot of export situations with the global protein shortage driven by ISF has really impacted our domestic market. And, and when you look at, you know these these records that that I'll discuss. It it really um, brings into focus what the market has done so far. You know up to the eighth of October, the national trade lamb twenty third of August um, it hit nine fifty one. The heavy lamb on the twentieth of August hit nine eighty three. Um, the national light lamb hit eight ninety five on the twenty second of September. Um, the restocker lamb on the twenty sixth of August um, six weeks ago hit ten seventy eight. And the mutton indicator on the 7th of July hit 702 cents. Um, there's not many more indicators that we provide to industry that hasn't been broken. Um, you know, there's been some serious sale highlights, obviously, through the sale yards. Um, no less than Wagga yesterday with that pen of 42 kilo carcass weight, um, heavy old season lambs breaking the national record from Bendigo in February, hitting 399 20 a kilo. Um, you know, and with the, with the sale yard supply down and and the lowest mutton slaughter we've seen um, or, or expecting to see for a long time, it's really improved that demand, obviously. And and we've discussed the export situation, and you know, mutton this year has really been a highlight and performed really well. So, you know, I did want to make 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 notice of that. Um, you know, you look across to WA um, in a bit more of an isolated case, and it again has you know outperformed what 2020 was doing and is doing really well. Um, you know, at the minute it's it's 31 cents a kilo better than what it was at the same time last year or 6%. Um, and the really exciting piece as we discuss the herd rebuild for, or sorry, flock rebuild for WA, you know, restocker lambs and marine line lambs, which we know are both important to their live export industry, which is, you know, a, a real big fundamental of that production system over there. The restockers are 30% stronger than the same time in 2020. 
accounting for 255 cents a kilo and and last week they hit 896 um you know and it really demonstrates that restocker price uh you know produces intentions for, for what they're wanting to to achieve after the west to east migration and some below average seasonal conditions which is really positive to see um and i'll touch on the merino lambs as well they're up 27 percent compared to the same time last year um, to be at 6.74 cents a kilo or a rise of 179 cents overall, which is which is really good. And 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 as we discussed that, obviously very positive for the live export industry moving forward with with the re-entry of Saudi Arabia, you know, and the progression of of what that may look like in, in coming years as as volumes hopefully pick up. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Ripley. Um, that actually draws a conclusion to the questions that I wanted to put forward to the panel. Um, of just having a look at some of the questions. Obviously, you guys have done a fantastic job because there aren't too many. Um, so we got one here from Robert Herman at Mercado. Thank you for that, Robert. Do you have any insights into whether there is any increased acres expected for sheep production um, and are sheep likely to be included into crop enterprises? Uh I, I'm happy to answer this with you, Rip, um, and thanks for your question, yep. Robert. Is one of the things that we have we have seen definitely this year, and we saw it in Victoria, is that we saw um, so while breeding ewe numbers went down in some areas of Victoria, the numbers of lamb on hand went up, and what we saw people doing a lot more was moving into trading, uh, trading on and off uh, lambs on and off stubbles. So while so we saw a bit of a move back into that sort of sheep and lamb trading. Um, enterprises that we hadn't really seen. So while there wasn't necessarily an increase in areas expected for sheep production, people were really utilising that increase in cropping um, that we that we saw in Victoria, and we expect that to sort of continue uh, this year. You might have something you want to add. Yeah, Steve, you make a good point. You know, you look across to WA and and the situation that we've discussed over there with with you know Cyclone Saroja starting a, a really positive season for for autumn and, and winter over there in WA, and and as a result, Robert, I think of that you know that grain price and the grain market that it's doing at the minute, cereals and and oil seeds, obviously you know all included. Yes, producers did plant a big crop. Um, you know, on the back of, of the price and the market, the way it was moving. But to, to answer your question and, and to support Steve's comment from the from the sheep meat survey results we got, that complementary trading trading lambs and, and stock off stubbles, you know, is a very prominent opportunity. And, and with the, the market the way it is at the minute, there's no reason that that can't continue for WA, WA as well, which does play a big part in, you know, in the national sheep flock numbers. And and you know it it really is um, a positive situation to be in with with the quality of those stubbles expected over there following harvest. Great attempt, guys. Thank you for that. That's actually all the questions we have. Final um, moments for any of one wanting to send in a question. We really value um, again some of the insights or some of the questions that you guys might have. Um, and if not, we can wrap up and. All good then. All right. Thanks for that, guys. You've done a terrific job, I think, um, covering a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Um, so please stay tuned again. You'll be able to access everything on our website on the trends and analysis page shortly after this. Um, and thank you, Robert. So it just says thank you. Um, so lastly, I just want to hand over to Ripley, who's just going to quickly talk about the MLA updates. Um, and what that is. I will. Um, just before that, Maddie um, Stutchbury touched on it. She's asking for a copy of this presentation. And yes, that will be available. You've got our contact details. Please touch base with us following uh, the end of this webinar and we'll be more than happy to support you with providing those uh, in PDF version. I will discuss the MLA updates. Um, they're starting on the uh, 18th of October on a Monday and they'll finish on Monday the 15th of November. There'll be five webinars um, covering all parts of the supply chain, all parts of the industry from research and development 
and, and objective measurement right through to international markets, domestic marketing, you know, food consumption, market analysis, all, all kinds of things. And, and the point of these is to provide to you as producers and, and industry uh, people involved around how levies are being used to your levies and your contribution is being used to make an impact on, on industry. They're covering a broad range of topics. Um, there'll be a one hour webinar and they'll really provide some some interesting insights from a really large scope of the business um, right across the board on what the MLA is doing um, with, with, with your support and how we can improve the industry. Um, please jump onto the MLA's website and visit updates.mla.com.au um, to uh, register for the events and attend. I, I really recommend it and I'm sure you'll all get a lot of value out of it. Um, and obviously to finish that because of COVID, um, the pardon me, the AGM won't be uh, held in person this year, but on the 25th of November it will be um, it will be broadcast and that's another exciting opportunity for everyone to take part in. So yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for that, Rip. Um, so that actually brings the webinar to an end and that has been presented by the market information team. We're just a three man band. Um, so yeah, we really value your feedback and we would really love it if you guys could just take a few minutes just to fill out the survey at the end. Um, and were there any final words from the panel before we end up? Yeah, Stu, just I just think to to your point, uh, Magella Fernando uh, has posted that post webinar survey um, in in the chat. You'll all be able to see it, and we really urge you to provide us some feedback because we want to deliver to you guys um, the best the best possible presentation, answer your questions, and we'd really welcome some comments. There's an opportunity there for you to comment on on what we could improve or what, what we could um, include for, for next time. So thank you all for, for having us today and we're yeah really, really happy to be able to present this to you. We might not be over. I um, just, uh, there's a late question from the guys at Rabo, but I uh, just would like to really reiterate what uh, Stu and Rip have said, that we really appreciate you guys taking the time and the feedback uh, at the end of this will be really, Crucial, we'd really like to run these for all of our updates that we do um, in the market information team. So we want to make sure that uh, we're delivering what meets your needs. So that feedback will really help us. And, and if you got a lot of value out of today, we, we think they're great. Um, Angus Gidley Bird has, Baird has just asked a question. You noted that chilled lamb exports dropped, but I think as a proportion of total exports, they have increased with the change in food consumption. I've just lost the Oh, it's been published. Um, increased retail sales as a result of COVID. What do you see as the outlook for chilled lamb exports? I think, uh, I think to that thing, uh, Angus, we do expect it to increase. I think the key is going to be access to um, mm. uh, access to uh, freight uh, logistics. I think we definitely expect that to increase. We know that some uh, chilled product has been hitting country and then being frozen in country for shelf life reasons. But I think the key thing that we want uh, is, or that we expect to see, is that chilled exports uh, of lamb will increase. It will be that big push in in when uh, when uh, containers are easier to get access to when flights are flying again. I think we really will see that chilled exports will increase. Perfect. That's all the questions and I think we'll wrap it up there guys. Thanks everyone for joining us and we hope to see you next time with the beef projections being released in hopefully about a month's time at this stage, but we'll keep you guys updated. Thanks so much. Thank you.